listening to the Place We Find Ourselves podcast. I'm Adam Young, and it's a privilege today to be joined again by John Eldridge. John, welcome back to the podcast. Yeah, thanks, Adam. It's good to see you again. You were you were my guest for episode 81 when we talked about your book, How to Get Your Life Back. And you've recently you've been busy. You've since written another book uh, called Resilient restoring your weary soul in these turbulent times. So before, and that's what, that's what we're going to focus on today is, is this book that you've written. But before we get into the content of it, let's begin with this. Why? Why did you write this book? Well, there's a wild story, right? Because when you and I were last talking, we were, we were in quarantine. The the pandemic had just rolled through in spring of, of 20. And I had written Get Your Life Back to help people with the toxicity of just modern life, right? It was just the crazy of the pace and the technology. And, you know, nobody was human anymore. Like, it's just like, how do we become human again? And then, and that book came out in February of 20. And then the pandemic rolls through. And so the timing of that was actually super kind by God because it helped a lot of people through through those couple of years. But now, you know, as you as you well know, <laughs> we are in the cascade effect of, of the last two years, right? Resilient came out of my compassion for what I was seeing in our clients, what I was seeing in myself and my family of the effect of what it's been like for all of us to live through two years of global trauma. Because the crazy thing is, Adam, is that everybody's acting like we're okay now. That is the crazy, is everybody's like, hey, we got tacos, we got concerts, like you can, you can fly anywhere you want in the world now, we're good, right? We're all, we're all good. I'm like, look, this denial is not going to help anybody. Yeah, and that's that's one of the places you start right from the get-go of this book is naming kind of where we are as a world on the, not even the other side yet of the pandemic, but it's beginning to end. And you're saying, look, our hearts and our bodies have suffered something and they need to be tended to. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, can we just all be kind and call it trauma? They, they took away your normal. They, they, they locked you up. They bombarded you with negative news and they, they were, nobody knew where the finish line was. It wasn't like we could say, okay, you know, we're going to do this for, for three weeks and then we're good, you know, and then they'd move it out again. And then it's three months and they're like, okay, okay, okay I can do this for three months. Yeah. And then they'd move it out again. And it was the kids are at home and you're working from your kitchen table on your laptop and it's zoom meetings. And it's, it's all that for two years, you know, of some form or other. And then you throw into that the high octane politics and the anger and and the fear and masks all of that right <laughs> like folks um telling everyone that we're fine now because we're past it it is like telling a survivor of abuse that i'm really glad that the trauma is over because you know you don't live in that house anymore you're like the the trauma's just begun. Like the the yeah, it, yeah, it's just heartbreaking, Adam. I'm, but we all do this. It's human nature. That's one of your starting places at the beginning of this book is everyone wants to move on and not tend to the wounded places inside. So let me ask this, John. Why do you think? most of us want to press forward and move on living in a sort of denial of how the pandemic has affected us? I think there is an embarrassment, maybe even a little shame to our depleted condition. Okay. So I literally just one hour ago, I had a conversation with three very mature adults 
who are wise and live well. And I was just asking them, I wanted to know, how are you doing? Check in on your reserves. What, what's it like these days? And the stories that they began to tell, one guy was saying, oh my gosh, I went to a Memorial Day barbecue thing. I could barely take it. I got nothing in the tank. And, and these are the stories that start coming out. We can talk more about that and why that is. But I think it was the third gentleman who named this for me. He said, I'm embarrassed that I'm not back to 100% because everybody's expecting me to be. And the world's expecting me to be because now, you know, we lost time. So let's go, let's go, let's go. You know, let's travel, let's see people. We got to make up for work and productivity. But all three of them were admitting. I'm not there. I don't got it. I think we're trying to hide our actual condition from the world because everybody else seems to be acting like we're we're all good now, right? Yeah, we're not fond of our neediness. <laughs> that is an understatement, my friend. But we're needy creatures. That's, we could say it this way, that's God's fault. That, that's just how God made us human beings. We need a lot. Yes, every day. Every day. Yeah, because not only are we needy, but we're leaky. <laughs> the, soul, the soul actually is porous. The soul leaks. And, and you know, you can, people can tell you how much they love you. And two days later, man, it's gone. You know, like you can crush a project and you can feel so on top of the world and, you know, two days later, it's gone. Mm -hmm. and, and so to bless that and to say, that's the nature of my humanity. I have to eat every day. I got to sleep every night. Every moment I have to take a new breath, right? Like I am a deeply dependent being. Okay, well, I bless that. It doesn't need to be a source of shame. But now let's make provision for it. Yes. And one of the things you do in this book is it's a very practical book. You have practices that you invite uh, the reader to participate in to replenish the heart, the body, the soul in these times. Yeah. And I want to just read a little, a couple sentences from your introduction. You write, I've laid out the book in the form of a survival guide because in this hour, we don't need inspiration and cute stories. We need skills and tools to strengthen our heart and soul. We need supernatural resilience made available in Christ and what he is providing. That's from the introduction. Now, the implication of what you're saying is that there is a power pulsing in the world that we can tap into. Yeah. The, the power of the ascended Christ and that practices are one of the ways that we tap into the power of Christ. So can you give an example of one of these practices? Because the book's filled with lots of them and how it has affected you this year. Yeah, it was fun to write it like a survival guide because I, I, first of all, I needed to write it like that. And secondly, I thought it would be more interesting uh, each chapter to pause and go, okay, so what have we learned from that? Like, what's the skill now that, that will help me? So here's a beautiful thing. I don't know where this got lost in the Christian tradition, but the human heart is the new temple. So you had the tabernacle and then you had the temple, okay? And they were beautiful places and they were designed to remind you of Eden. When you went into the tabernacle or the temple, there were trees, flowers on the walls. Everything's gorgeous and it's embroidery. There's jewels, there's gold, the menorah. You know, it, it, was, it was literally designed intentionally to make you feel like you were going back to the garden of Eden. So if the human heart is the new temple, and it is, then what I began to pray was, I pray that you would restore Eden in my heart. I need the replenishment, like the lushness, the beauty of Eden, because every human heart now, every follower 
of Jesus, your heart is a little outpost of Eden in the world. Part of the point is my normal stuff is not sufficient for recovery in this hour. You know, I can't just take a bike ride and, and be better. I can't take a day off and be better. The depletion runs deeper than that in all of us. The effects of the trauma run deeper than, than a hike can, can take care of. So I began to pray is one example. I pray that your Eden would fill this little outpost, this little temple. Would you restore Eden in my soul? And it began to become a source of genuine help. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm comforted by it. I can feel it happening. It's like, yes, the Eden replenishment of God here in me. It's not only beautiful, but it's so practical. Yes. And this is what you're doing in Resilient, the book. You're, you're after, chapter after chapter, you lay out practices, words we can speak, ways we can use our will to invite Jesus to renew, restore, heal. Yeah. Tend to this body and heart of ours, this temple. Yeah. Yeah. Here's another fun one. So... <clears throat> In John 7, Jesus says, I, I would love for the river of life to flow from your heart. He says, anyone who's thirsty, come to me, and the river of life will flow from your heart. Well, the river flowed in Eden. And in Revelation, when John sees the new Eden, okay, we know it's Eden because the tree of life is there again, right? The tree of life and the river of life is right there. Flowing. I'm like, wait a second, that's more Eden imagery. So I started asking for that. <laughs> I'm like, I need, you know, and this isn't just um, a quick prayer. Like the prayers are contemplative. They're, they're, it is centering prayer. It's settling into our souls. It's, it's meeting Christ in the depths of our temple heart and asking for these help this the provision the strengthening of god in in this hour and okay so here's the, here's the little diabolical piece of this story but people are too tired to ask for it that's the really wicked scheme is it is that even mature lovers of god are like no nah, i think i just need tacos I think I just need a day at the beach. <laughs> they, like, like, that's why Resilient is written in such a simple, you know, it's doable. In fact, I got to tell you about this cool, cool thing we're working on. So you remember we talked about the one minute pause app when I was on the show last time. And that was also an amazing story because we're not an app company. We don't build apps, but we were moved to put this centering prayer app out there. One minute pause. I'm like, I can get people to pause for 60 seconds. So we've just put a new feature. It's about to open up in June, like around the 15th in the app called 30 Days to Resilience. Because what I'm able to do is I'm able to pray with folks. And so we play this beautiful music and we give reflective questions and then we lead, I lead them in centering prayer like Eden. And it's coming out soon, folks. It's on, it's on the One Minute Pause app. It's free. Um, it'll be a big help. Yeah. In the second chapter, uh, you point out that at any given point of history, there are dominant stories that capture our attention. And one of the examples you give is Genghis Khan ruled the largest land empire in history. And you say, hey, look, if you were living at that time, Genghis Khan and his empire would have seemed felt like the big story. But where is his empire now? And your point is that empires rise and fall, but the story of God the story of what God has done and is doing in human affairs will always be the fundamental story of the world. And let me just read a short paragraph from this chapter. Here's what you say. You say the story, because it's, it's an invitation. It's a challenge and an invitation. And you write, the story of God 
should get more of your attention time than any other media. If you spend 30 minutes a day reading the news and social media, and who among us doesn't, right? That's my ad lib. Then you need to spend more than 30 minutes in the scriptures or listening to biblical podcasts instead of using your downtime scrolling through Facebook or Instagram. Use it to read something that reminds you of the story of God. I love this. I, I have found this to be true for me. E each day, I need to focus some of my attention on who God is and what God is doing, because the empires around us clamor for my attention. The battle is for our attention. The way the human brain works, if a new image, thing, substance, picture, appears within your field of vision, you are designed and created as a being to look at it. Because back in the day when it was a lion or a leopard, you need to be aware, right? Like, so we are predator aware <clears throat> when something new enters our field of vision. Well, in television, something new enters your field of vision every second. So media and TikTok and da 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 da, da right? This, the war is for your attention. You go to the gas station, there, there, there's a little television on the gas station pump, for heaven's sakes. So the war is for your attention. To hold on to that idea that the story of God is actually the story of the world is so important for our well-being, just for the settledness of, I know it looks like COVID is the story right now. It's actually not. I know that Ukraine looks like the story right now. It's actually not. These are important things, but they are not the dominant thing. The dominant thing is God and his kingdom and his work in the world. The war for our attention is something that we can win. Like you can choose. You can choose what gets your attention every day. Chapter four is very personal for you. You confess that you suffered a couple of devastating emotional blows in the summer of 2021. And here's how you put it. You said, there were things I felt God had promised me, which did not come through in heartbreaking ways. I felt so betrayed, so abandoned. But then in my vulnerable state, something came over me, a dark cloud, a sort of suffocating fog, which urged me to give up my life with God. First of all, thank you. I mean, thank you for writing truthfully and vulnerably, because I think so many of us have had experiences mm -hmm. where we feel abandoned by God and we lose heart. We, we lose hope. As you look back on last summer and those devastating disappointments, can you say more, John, about what was that like for you? And, and how, how have you navigated that sense that God deeply disappointed you? Yeah, yeah, because I thought I was alone in it. But when I began to share my experience with a few of my friends, they started telling me their stories. I deeply believe that God is good. But when we experience what feels like betrayal by God, it throws us hard. It threw me hard. There was heartache. So one of those heartache stories continues to this day. So this is, this is still going on. There was confusion of like, wait, what? I, I Wait a second. I thought you were for me. I thought you were in this, God. Like, what the heck? And then in that heartache, I felt very vulnerable. Let me pause to explain something. So here I'm sitting, I'm literally sitting in my truck in a small town parking lot in Colorado, literally as this is going on. So I'm receiving the bad news on my phone. And my heart is just blown sideways. I just felt T-boned, you know. Now, Paul 
in Second Thessalonians warns that before the climax of this part of the story, there's going to be a great falling away. It's called the apostasia. Um, <clears throat> and he says, I, and I heard a really beautiful theologian talking on his podcast about this, saying, look, I don't think we're going to see people marching in the streets with I love Satan placards and I hate Jesus tattooed on their foreheads. He's like, it's not that. He says, what we're going to see is lots of people giving up on God out of disappointment. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> like that, you, that's my story that, yes. <clears throat> so two things were taking place. One is human and the other is spiritual my human condition, I'm hurt. I'm mad. I'm confused. I'm sideways. I'm grieving. But then in my vulnerable state, this darkness comes in. And honestly, like there would be mornings I would wake up and I'd say, I, am, I, am I a Christian anymore? Mm -hmm. Like, do I even believe? And it was only as I began to talk to some of my friends and we're like, we started comparing notes and he went, wait, wait, I know that darkness too. Yeah. Wait a second. And so we began to pray against the darkness while we were still in the heartache mm -hmm. and the darkness lifted and it actually left. And what I was left with was my heartache, which is, which is a much better place to be than with the darkness add on to it, right? The bolt on darkness there. I still need care and love and attention to the heartache, but I'm not battling the desolation anymore. But I got on our podcast, Adam, and I started talking about this experience, and wow, we started hearing from loads of people saying, wait a second, when you use the word desolation, that's it. That's it. And then my phone, like I could read, I, my phone's, I've been getting texts and emails in the last six months from really mature believers who are saying, you know, I just don't know. I don't know. I think I might be done. I think I might be done with Jesus. And here's the thing. There's always a genuine heartache. There's, there's, there's something there. There's a disappointment there, but then this thing, this darkness rolls in, in our vulnerability. And if we're not aware, you know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This isn't just you. Then we just, we make massive agreements with it. So yeah, I, I wanted to share that in the chapter to say, look, the disappointment's real. The heartache is real but let's not make agreements with this darkness. I would not, Paul says, I would not have you grieve as those who have no hope. I just want to say thank you for writing truthfully because so many people think that authors, spiritual leaders, people like you are kind of up here and have one experience of God and then everyone else is kind of can't access that. And what you confess in this chapter is, no, you're a human being and you had suffered some heartache that made you doubt whether you believed in this God that you've followed for decades. Yeah, we're human and it's, it's a vulnerable, this is a very vulnerable time to be human. Yeah, which is why I love chapter five because chapter five is about the mothering of God. It's about attaching to God as our mother. Now I talk a lot about attachment on this podcast. Uh, God created us with a need for deep relationship with others, deep connection with other people. That's what attachment is all about. And deep connect created us with a need for deep connection with God. Mm -hmm. And you explain in this chapter that one way of understanding salvation, it's not a theological claim you're making. You're just saying, hey, look, one way of understanding what God is doing in, in human life is through the lens of attachment. And what you say is that through the person of Christ, God has made it possible for each of us to develop 
a secure attachment to God. And after talking about all that, here's what you write. You say, so what do we do? We attach to God. We ask God for mothering. We go to the place in our souls where mother need lies. We go to our primal fears and we open our hearts to God. Uh, I mean, what a terrifying invitation. Can you say more, John, about what you are inviting the reader to do in this chapter? Yeah, yeah. But first, let's, let's talk about why. Because in times of upheaval, and you, if you don't like to call the last two years global trauma, you can just call it high stress. High stress times touch at the core of our being of will we be provided for? Will we be secure? That's why this is so important, because in our besieged humanity, most of us did not receive the healthy attachment that we needed as children. And so we've got some pretty deep doubts. Most people feel like, no, it's up to me. And so this is why I bring this into this particular book, because we're trying to care for our souls in a moment of, of you know, high stress, high pressure, deep deprivation stuff going on. It was the, it was the, you read this chapter, but it's a beautiful story of Dallas Willard, whose mother died when he was a tiny boy, three years old. He tried to climb into the casket to be with her at the funeral. Like, is that just the most touching, heartbreaking mm -hmm. picture of a child's need? for mother security, mother love, mother nurture. Mother is our first experience. I used to, I still write, I talk a great deal about the father wound. You know, at our, if you go to our camps and our retreats and stuff, we talk a great deal about the father wound. Um, but, but the first experience of secure attachment is actually with mother. So I'm looking at the human soul in this hour going, whoa, we all need the assurance. And God created motherhood. He created mothering. He can, you know, the whole idea, the whole thing came from our creator. He, in fathering and mothering are from our creator, God. I believe God is father but I believe that he transcends both categories because he created both. Come on. Like he, he created women. He created men. He created mothering, fathering. And so what we need, and this was Willard's, there's this beautiful story that Jim Wilder tells of being with Willard right as he was dying, right before Dallas passed uh, of his cancer, and Dallas is weeping because he is finally coming to the realization after 70 some years that what he's been looking for all his life is what he lost with his mother. He's been looking for secure attachment. And then you start listening to verses like, I am the vine, you are the branch. You are meant to be united to me. You are meant to be one with me. You listen to John 17, where Jesus says, Father, I pray that they would be one with us. Just as you are in me and I am in you, I pray that they would be in us. He's talking about union, the soul's union with God. The soul's union with God. And, and what brought Dallas to tears was, I, I never realized that was available. I never realized that I could ask for attachment love. That, that even this need, even this, could be met by my creator. I had a completely unattached mother. Uh, she was very bright, very smart, professional. She left um, the house when I was about four to go back to work, and she worked until she was 85. It's like I, I, I literally was never mothered. I have no memories of her reading a book to me. I have no memories of playing with my mom. She's still alive today. 
she's in her 90s now, but she, she, is, she herself is a very unattached woman. I've never seen her cry, never seen her express much emotion. And, and it was only as God began to show me, hey, John, like you didn't receive that attachment love that you needed as a child, and it is affecting the way that you are responding to people and relationships and especially crisis, right? Because crisis flushes things. And so you go through a global crisis and, and then those personal crises. And, and, and he, was, he was showing me, you, you, have, you do not have the assurance that attachment love I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Okay, those are literally the words of Jesus. Okay, that is attachment love. That is bonding with another in order to be secure. And I want to, I want to, I've been experiencing it with great relief, great solace to my soul. Um, current trauma opens up all your past trauma. Say it again. Current trauma opens up all of your past trauma. And, and if, you, if you read you know, the, the stuff on trauma, you would, you would think the trauma would sort of toughen you, to, you know, sort of callous you, you sort of build you know, sort of muscles for it. It actually sensitizes you. And, and so as we're trying to recover from trauma in our lives, uh, uh, attachment love is this beautiful help that that our creator who created mothering is able to bring to us as you were talking about your mother i felt grief well up in me that's where the chapter nine goes and that's the last thing i want to talk to you about is grief you talk about how many of us have this posture of the pandemic is ending. I just want to move on. But here's what you write about that posture. And it's, it's a couple of paragraphs, but I want to read them. You say there were so many losses and so many sources of heartache in 2020. I simply couldn't move on without attending to them. And I love this next sentence. What I had to do was sit down with a pad of paper and begin to put words to all that I had suffered as if I were talking to a therapist about a traumatic event. One by one, I had to name my losses. I needed to honor my soul by allowing for the fact that these were very real losses. I needed to name my sorrows and then grieve them, allowing the sadness to come forth and express itself. So good and yet so um, unnatural it feels to me. Well, people are scared of, of their grief. Right. They're scared of it. We all are. I am. Because we think, if I open that closet, I, I'm never getting out. Like, I'm just going to fall through the hole and I'll never, I'll never, I will be overwhelmed by my sadness. And so we just keep the door closed. But it doesn't work because your sadness turns into other things like depression, anxiety, rage, addictions, you know. And, and all my all my pals were talking about their trips for, you know, travel and their adventures and the things they're doing in my heart. I, I couldn't even dream. And it was because I was still stuck. The sadness was stuck in me. And so you, you have seen enough clients. You've worked with enough people. I have too, that we can assure everyone listening, your grief is not going to swallow you. It's not. The, the surprising thing is that as you feel it, name it, give it a voice, lament, it actually begins to lighten. And your soul comes up for air. You're like, oh my gosh, I thought I was going to spend years in that. 
but I'm actually doing better. And my capacity to dream is beginning to come back. My capacity to enjoy things. It, 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 yeah, grief is good for the soul. Our sorrows need to pass through our bodies. Yep. And that's not a metaphor. No. We don't take our bodies seriously enough and our sorrows seriously enough. And what you're inviting us to in this chapter is, I, I mean, I, I love it. Get out a piece of paper and at least honor the heartaches enough to write them down. Yes. And then the next step, of course, is to feel whatever feelings, whatever complicated feelings come up. But that's bearing witness and dressing, in the words of Jeremiah, it's dressing the wounds that you've suffered as though they were serious. Yes, that's beautiful, Adam. You can't heal without grieving. You just can't. You can't pretend. And the whole world is trying to pretend right now. And it's not going to work, by the way. It's not going to work. And it's... You know, I was reading the article today that they're expecting the biggest airline travel season ever. They're like, we are going to get deluged. Everyone's rushing out, trying to find relief and joy and goodness again. I just want life to be good again. Um, and I bless it. I hope you do. I hope you have a wonderful trip, everybody. Um, but it isn't enough to heal your humanity from what we've all been through. So let's take things like what we were just talking about, like grief, and use these tools to care for our souls. And that's really what I love about your book, the spirit behind it, John, is it's it comes from a pastoral place in you. Yeah. You, you're, you're wanting people to have access to practical things they can do to tap into the healing power of Jesus. I mean, I thought about this earlier when you, and we'll end here, when, when you were talking about Revelation. You know, in Revelation, it talks about the, the leaves of the tree in the garden, and it says this, the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Yeah. And this book, as I read it, it, it was like John wants healing for people who have suffered wounds. Yes. So thank you for writing it. It's called Resilient. Uh, if this conversation has been meaningful to you folks who are listening, you may want to spend time with this new book of John's. John, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, you're welcome, Adam. Great to chat with you today. We could have gone for hours. Mm -hmm.